Father, we are here this morning to join as a Christian family and sing your praises. We sing your praises through the songs that we vocalize. We sing your praises through prayer and talking to you. We sing your praises by the quality of life that we lead, how we show others around us that we are a follower. We are a believer that you are our Father and our Savior. That's how we sing the praises of God. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the nourishing rain. We thank you for what you have laid on Pastor Derek's heart this morning that you want us to hear Words that will encourage and strengthen as we go through this next week. Words that will guide, guide our lives and guide our actions and guide our words. Words that will help teach us how to treat each other. Lord, we just thank you for all you have given us, for the blessings of life, for friends and family, and for this church family. We give you all the praise that you so deserve. And Jesus said, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Oh, we need you to sing out on this one. Bring the pain that you've been hiding. Bring your scars and bring your shame. Every Secret, 
Bring your fear that things won't change. Bring your dreams and bring your words. Highest highs and lowest lows. Every hope you pin your heart on. Every hurt you can't let go. This morning. So, friends, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, even if it's on this little cart. I know it, it looks ridiculous. It feels ridiculous, too. So, anyway, thank you so much for being here because it is always, always, always good to be in the house of the Lord. And I'll tell you this morning, I was so wanting to come here. I always say that every Sunday, you know, it's good to be in the house of the Lord, but. I miss people. I miss being in the middle of it all. And uh, so this morning I was really looking forward to seeing folks and getting some handshakes and hugs and, 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 and talking to some folks. So thanks for, for being here. Looks like we're a little short today. I think some people are on vacation uh, doing some weekend stuff too. And I know 4th of July, last night we couldn't go to sleep till well after 1130. Kaboom, kaboom. <laughs> But, you know, it's only once a year. Uh, a couple things I wanted to mention. Uh, if you are available Thursday um, around 11 o'clock, uh, we're going to have people meet out here uh, in the parking lot, and then we're just going to go down to First Wayne. Uh, we are providing uh, the, the lunch uh, for the Peacemakers Academy. If you don't know anything about the Peacemakers Academy, it's one of the missions that we sponsor and are involved in here. And uh, what it is, is it's a, a group of, it's, it, it's spun out of Alive Missions with uh, our, our friend Angelo Manti, who comes to Taylor all the time and speaks to us. And uh, anyway, what, they were having a lot of fights and a lot of violence at uh, Southside High School. And uh, uh, anyway, it was brought to Angelo's attention. 
and they decided they were going to try to do a, a group there called the Peacemakers Academy. And what they basically do is they take a lot of the, uh, the peaceful protest uh, theology and ideology that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King implemented back in the 60s, and uh, they, they are teaching the kids how to deal with uh, arguments, um, uh, conflict, without going to violence. And uh, they implemented this plan last year. <laughs> they went months without any kind of violence, any fights, anything. I mean, it was remarkable. So much so uh, that the principal of the school uh, contacted the, the school board, and uh, every, they got together, and uh, last year we actually got to go to the, church, or to, the, to the high school. Imagine this. In today's culture, we were invited to the high school to pray over the rooms, the cafeteria, and the, the school board and the principal welcomed us to do this. I mean, this is unheard of, unheard of. And why are they so interested? It's because it's working. And uh, so this is something that we can really get behind. Uh, it, it's an opportunity for us to help. It was so successful at Southside uh, that it was voted uh, that they were going to implement this pro the same program at all the high schools in Allen County. So... Uh, here at Taylor Chapel, I let Angelo know that we would love to be a part of this. And um, so we're going to find out. Uh, we have a connection uh, through Kevin Clee with Snyder. He was the band director there for years. And Andrea uh, Hines is also a, an active teacher at uh, Northside. So Angelo told me that we'd probably uh, be able to sponsor either Northside High School or um, Snyder. I don't know yet, but... Anyway, we're going to provide uh, lunch for this Peacemaker Academy group on Thursday. Uh, the food's already been taken care of. If you want to bring some desserts, we'd like to lavish them with some really great desserts. And I know you, you folks can do it because you lavish me with them all the time. So we're, we ordered Ziano's. We're going to deliver that down there. If you want to see firsthand how this mission works, and, and if you come, you will be impressed. These kids are sharp. And it, it just, it, it'll do your heart good to see uh, what's going on uh, in, in, with this mission. So if you want to come and participate, meet some of the kids, serve them lunch, meet here at 11 o'clock, we'll drive downtown, and uh, I promise you, uh, you will be blessed I I if you attend. Uh, we have our men's breakfast coming up, and I've already found out that we've got three or four of our best cooks uh, that aren't going to be making it because they have vacations and plans and things going on. Uh, as people do in the summer, but the actual best cook <laughs> will be there. Now that I, now I'm going to I'm going to pepper that with this. Good Lord willing, I've had two two Saturdays in a row that I haven't been able to do it because uh, you know. And uh, so anyway, um, men's breakfast. Uh, if if you want to meet some some new folks, be a part of the church, uh, you know, cram. 3,000 calories into a half hour. Come on to the men's breakfast, and, and I think you'll really like it. Our chosen um, Bible study is still going strong. Uh, this week, we're looking at episode three, which I think is one of the very best episodes of the whole show. I love this episode. So uh, if you haven't come or you didn't sign up, I've got plenty of books. There's plenty of room in the classes. You haven't missed a whole lot come and we'll get you plugged in i think you'll like it uh, also mike carley's bike ride for our youth is going on he's riding 100 miles uh, and he's taking donations for our uh, youth program the money that uh, he collects from his bike ride will go directly to scholarships to send kids to uh, summer camp and i see a lot of kids here this morning i see danielle here who's overseeing the the summer cap thing if you have a child, a grandchild, a neighbor child, uh, 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 a child you see on the street, invite them. <laughs> and uh, Taylor Chapel will pick up the tab for them to uh, go to summer school. It's important, or uh, to uh, church camp. It is important uh, to do this. Our two youngest sons, uh, it changed their lives. It absolutely changed their lives. And I know as a youth, when I went, it is so powerful to be in a group where Christian faith is the, the, the majority, the norm rather than the exception, and it does the kids a lot of good. So 
keep that in mind. With that being said, I'm going to try some, I'm going to see if the kids can come up here, and I'm going to try to do a, a, a children's lesson from my chair. So kids, come on up here. Hey, guys. Could you guys, could you guys kind of stand up and come up here like around Pastor Derek? Go up here. Because I got something. Oh. What is that? Joel? Joel, are you okay? What's the matter with you? Oh, my gosh. Joel's got something in his eye. Let me see that. Oh, oh my gosh. Joel, hang, hang on here a second. Let me help you get that out of your eye, okay? I got my glasses on. And uh, Joel, now you hold still, okay? Can You hold still. Now let me. I, Joel, I'm just kidding. You know that. I would do that to you. You know, today, <laughs> you might ask why Pastor Derek had this. But, you know, today, we're going to look at a, a story in the Bible that Jesus tells us. And, and in this story, he talks about a person who has, uh, he's looking at somebody who has a little tiny speck of something in your eye. Has anybody ever got like a, a piece of wood or, uh, you know, maybe a piece of paper? Have you ever had that? It hurt, yeah, didn't it? I feel like a lot of people are like, hurt. Yeah, oh, I know. It hurts so bad. Even when something's that little, when it's in your eye, it feels this big, doesn't it, Gracie? Have you had something in your eye? Yeah, it's terrible. So when you get something in your eye, what do you want? You want somebody to take it out, don't you? Just take some eye drops. Just take some eye drops. And sometimes the eye drops just don't work, you know? I've, had, I've, had, I've gotten... Uh, you know, pieces of leaf, or uh, when I used to detassel corn, I'd get corn sh stalks kind of get in the side of my eye, and it hurt, and all I'd want was somebody to get it out. But, you know, I always wanted somebody, like, not even my mom. I'd rather have a doctor or somebody that knew what they were doing. But, you know, the last thing in the world I'd want? Yeah. I wouldn't want somebody that was wearing some crazy contraption like this with a big old stick in their eye, would you? No? No? That's what Jesus is telling. I, you know, I know it would be. And could you imagine using something like this to get something out of your eye and you couldn't see? That'd be awful, wouldn't it? One time, someone threw a whole handful of dirt in my eye. Oh, that's awful. My my sister got sand in her eye once. It's just terrible. I but get every I get like everything in my eye. You get everything. <laughs> JD gets everything in his eye. But you know, the the story today that we're going to look at, Jesus talks about. Uh, how when, when we see somebody has a speck in their eye, we shouldn't ever think that if we have a stick or a log in our eye, that we have any business pulling something out of somebody else's eye. You know, but when Jesus tells us this, he's really kind of talking about something else. What he's saying is that, you know, if you have a big log in your eye, what business do you have seeing something in, something so little as a speck in another person's eye. What he's telling us is that all the time, it's a lot easier for us to notice something small that somebody's not doing right rather than the big things that we might be doing right. Sometimes we accuse people of things uh, without really knowing what their motive is or if it's true. And sometimes we, we, we just blame somebody for something that we really shouldn't. And a lot of times, it's a lot easier for us to notice the faults and the things wrong in other people's lives other than ourselves. Would you, would you rather worry about what somebody else is doing, or would you rather somebody talk to you about all the bad things you're doing? It's a lot easier to say, look what they're doing. Look what they did. I've seen it in, at the preschool sometimes. What are you doing? Oh, they did it. And they point the finger and say some, somebody else did it. Yeah, I've done it too, J.D. It's okay. A, a lot of people do it or I wouldn't be talking about it. Jesus wouldn't have talked about it. That's why he talks about it. What he's telling us in this story today, and I'm sure Miss Danielle will talk about it with you more, is that in order for us to help somebody else with a little problem, we have to fix our big problems first. We can't, I couldn't work on your eye if I have this big log in mine. So Jesus tells us that we need to get rid of the faults and the problems in our lives. Bef log, right, before we can help other people. And I think that's what he's talking about. So, what I'm telling you today is before you start 
noticing everything that somebody else is doing wrong, you might want to think, what am I doing wrong? If there's an argument and you're not getting along with somebody or you're having a problem with someone, you might want to think instead of pointing out everything they did wrong and they didn't do right, you might want to think or say, well, what did I do to cause this? What could I have done to make it better? And if you do that, you'll be doing what Jesus asked us to do. Okay? You kids do that? You think you can do it? Well, good luck, because I have trouble with it sometimes. So let's pray together, okay? Let's close our eyes, bow our heads, and pray. Dear God, thank you so much uh, for the lessons that Jesus teaches us. And, and Lord, help us to, to look at what we can fix in ourselves before we try to fix things in others. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kids, you can go with Miss Danielle to Children's Church. You get eye buggies? <laughs> yeah, I used to get eye buggies too. Mm -hmm. There's a scripture in Matthew chapter 7. It's, uh, it's right at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is just this wonderful three chapters where Jesus doesn't even mention the gospel in it. Some people say, you got to preach the gospel. Gotta be, oh, yeah, we preach the gospel. But, you know, it's interesting in, in this sermon, which so many people will say it's the greatest sermon of all times. Jesus doesn't really preach the gospel. You know, because the, the gospel message is repentance and uh, being um, uh, made new, rejuvenated, repent and believe in the gospel, uh, accept Christ, uh, being covered in his blood. Uh, being uh, made new again, these sort of things. Uh, but what Jesus is doing in this sermon is he's already taken for granted that these folks know. He's talking to a group that he, he, he believes is already, understands that part of it. So what he talks about in these three chapters, and what this sermon uh, on the mount is really about, it, it, it's, a, it's about application. It's about how should I react to the gift of grace? What does it look like to be redeemed, what does it look like to become a new creature in Christ? What are the, what are the things that I need to do uh, to, to live into God's will? What, what does God want from me? Well, you know, he know, you, you know what he says. He says, you know, we're to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second thing, second most important, just a little bit lower, is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And then his third commandment to us is to go and make disciples. And when I look at this, uh, this scripture that we're going to look at here, um, I see all three of those things at work, especially uh, focusing on loving your neighbor as yourself and making disciples. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, we Christians, uh, you know, we might say, oh, we get a bad rap, but sometimes we get a legitimate rap uh, about hypocrisy. And if we're always going to be judgmental, if we're always pointing the finger, uh, we're, we're setting ourselves up for that. And it's not always the best uh, approach when you're trying to disciple people, evangelize people to get them to come on board. You're this, you're that, you're horrible. You know, I, I mean, I, I've told you the story. Uh, you know, there used to be this uh, evangelist who would come to Ball State every year when I was uh, going there uh, back when I was a very young man. Uh, Brother Jed, he was called. He'd stand on the corner down at the traffic light at the crossing, which is a bit, one of the busiest intersections in the, in the state of Indiana, He'd, he'd get on an actual soapbox, megaphone, and he would just call out uh, to uh, the, you know, you sorority girls or prostitutes, uh, you know, your skirts are too short, you know. Uh, he'd just yell awful things, and, and, you know, he'd call out all these sins. And, and you know, at the time, I wasn't, uh, you know, I knew about my faith. I had been a Christian, but I'd fallen back on it. And when I watched this man, it enraged me. And, and, and as a person who knew uh, the scriptures, I knew what he was doing was not helpful. You know, a, a few years later, uh, back in the, in t the 2000s, uh, they had the Super Bowl in Indianapolis. Angel and I went up there to the Super Bowl village, and uh, the, there was a guy just like that. He was there. You know, sinner, heathen, homosexual, you're going to hell. You know, hate it. You know, all, just yelling and screaming, making assumptions based on how a person looked and so what their sins were calling them out, screaming them out for everybody. 
And I, at the time, it was like I had been pastor in a church for a very short period of time, and I was very involved in evangelism because Christ had come into my life and changed it, and I wanted that for other people. And, and I heard this guy going on and on, and I looked at Angela and I said, I can't take it. I've got to talk to him. And I, and I went over and I said, how many people have you reached like this? Oh, well, I just plant the seeds. The seeds of destruction. And I looked at him and I said, you know, you would be doing all us Christians a, a service if you didn't do this because it is hard enough without you <laughs> affirming all these things that aren't true that people say about us. How do we approach evangelism? Christ calls us to do it. How do we treat one another? The, the scripture we're going to look at today is one that you've heard. And uh, uh, I, I preached on this same passage two or three times over the course of my life. I looked at my uh, notes from previous sermons. They weren't any good at all. I don't know why anybody used to listen to me preach. <laughs> but today, I, I'm asking that you look at a familiar story, a story that's probably familiar to most of you here, and try to see it with new eyes and maybe think through it a little bit different. See if we can do that. Let's look at the scripture. It comes from Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. And uh, you can follow along with me. And these are the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you say, uh, why do you say that speck that is in your brother's eye um, but you do not notice uh, the log in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Don't, do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Will you pray with me? Lord, I just pray now that uh, you will speak to, to us this morning through this passage, something new, uh, something that uh, uh, we can put into our lives and, and help us to, uh, to be better Christians and be uh, better kingdom winners, Lord. Uh, I pray that you fill me with your spirit and, and give me the words you'd have me to say. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. About a year ago, uh, I was having a cookout at my house, and uh, we were in the backyard, and it was evening, and we were just sitting around chatting with some friends, and, and, and one, of the, one, of the, one of my guests, uh, he, he was sitting there in, on the back patio, and he looked at me, and he, he said, uh, you know, when I get to heaven, he goes, I, 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 I've got a question I want to ask God. And I thought, yeah, you know, I've heard this. I've heard people say this, haven't you? Oh, I, you know, when I get to heaven, when I see Jesus, I got, quite, you know. And I, I said, well, what, what question do you, would you ask him? And he said, when I get to heaven and I see God, I'm going to ask him why he created mosquitoes. And I thought, yep. Yeah. I thought about it for a second. It's like, yeah, what, what, what is up with mosquitoes? And, you know, what, what's up with snakes and some of these other things? I, I don't understand the purpose. And, you know, um, I've heard people say, these kind of things. Sometimes they're as lighthearted as mosquitoes and snakes or something like that, but I've also heard people say things like, you know, uh, when I get to heaven, I, I, I want to ask God, you know, why, why, why is it that I, I lost a child? Why, why, why did I miscarry? Why, why did my mother get cancer? Why, why is there pain and suffering? You might want to say, oh, why did I fall down the steps and break my ankle in three places? God respects that. My, my, my best spiritual intuition tells me that uh, when you get there, you're not going to be wanting to ask any questions, <laughs> especially none of those. I think you'll just be overwhelmed with the glory. But I get it, and I, I don't think the Lord has a problem with that. But, you know, um, I'm sure 
most of you said something about like that. But uh, the question I have this morning, or, or what I would run past you, ha, ha, has it ever occurred to you that uh, Jesus might have some questions for you? You know, uh, today he's going to ask a question that we're going to look at. And over the next few weeks, I want to look at some of the other questions Jesus asked. He asked several questions of us. And some folks might say, well, you know, that was over 2,000 years ago, or he was talking to a group of, of uh, uh, Jewish people, or he was talking about you know, to ancient people, or he was talking to a group of disciples, or he was talking to the Pharisees, or, you know, he was asking these questions of these different groups. But friends, Jesus is asking you these questions today just as much as he was asking them then. And if Jesus asks you a question, and he doesn't ask a lot of them, I'm going to think, or I'm going to assume that it's pretty important that I know the answer. Or at least I, I consider it. Or I think about it. Well, the question that Jesus asks today, it, it's almost uh, maybe the, the funniest kind of question. I mean, it's obviously serious in, in nature, but uh, Jesus is is involved in, in using hyperbole here. You know, he, he, he's, uh, you know, he's exaggerating, you know, this ridiculousness of a board in somebody's eye. Because, I mean, I, I tried to put this board in my eye, and it just, it just wouldn't fit. I couldn't get it in there. So, Jesus is making this point by this, this really, you know, uh, extreme analogy. But I think it, it, it teaches us a, a very important lesson. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good illustration. You know, uh, one of the things when you think about this, Jesus is talking about a speck and a board. And, you know, when I look at this, there's a little gap here. And I can, with my finger, here, I got it. Here. I got a speck. Can you guys see that? Of course you can. It's a speck. I also have this board. And if this was in my eye... Could you see this? You can see this for a half a mile away. And it's ridiculous, right? If I had this little speck right here in my eye, could you see it? No. So Jesus is talking about something that's huge and something that's small. But as the kids noted, even something as small as this little speck in your eye is going to aggravate and irritate and cause you trouble. You've had something in your eye. Every one of the kids up here did. You know what it feels like. Something that small, it, 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 it could almost disable you. So you get it out. It, it's going to drive you crazy. So this analogy really works. Uh, the, the, the question we're going to ask today uh, is simple. It's found in verse 3 and 4. Uh, and it's this. Why do you see the speck? Why do you see that little tiny speck in your brother's eye? And you might be able to see it for half a mile away, but you don't even notice the log that's in your own eye. And how can you imagine and possibly think that you could take the speck out of your brother's eye with, with that big old thing in your eye? You know, and so like I showed the kids, even with my special glasses, and if you can't, they didn't want me digging around in their eye with this. I can't see it. This question. Uh, is followed by two other verses. Uh, and, and the first verse it's followed by is Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. And I would just be willing to say, and, 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 and I'm pretty sure that this is the most quoted verse from the Scriptures. And some people say, oh no, John 3, 16, it's the story of the gospel. Well, yeah, it is. But it doesn't defend immoral behavior. We have, a, we have this magic Scripture that anybody, any secular person, you don't have to be a believer, you could be anybody in the world, you, you, you don't have to believe in God at all, but you know it's a deal stopper. If somebody's asking you to change a behavior or they're questioning something you're doing or, uh, or anything, all you have to do is whip out uh, a Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, and it's a deal stopper. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Shut up, don't complain, don't, don't look at my life, don't call out sin, don't, don't tell me that, that uh, uh, truth is truth. I don't want to hear it. You're not my judge. Have you ever heard anybody say that? <laughs> You're not my judge. I've had my kids say that once. That didn't go well for them. 
You know, uh, this is the most quoted, misunderstood scripture in the whole Bible. No doubt. So much so, I did a little research, and, and if you look at Google searches, um, this scripture, you know, where in the Bible do you find uh, judge not? That question has been Googled four times. Four times more often than where do you find God so loved the world. Four times. Everybody knows it. And they pull it out like a pistol. It stops the conversation. Hey, Christian, let me remind you. Your own Savior tells you not to ever you know, make, make any kind of decision, uh, uh, you know, inspect the fruit, or, or to come to any assumptions about a behavior that, that's not your own. Don't judge anybody. Is that what Jesus is asking us? You know? We have to be very careful. There's this thing called proof texting. I, you know, it's, it's, it, what, what it boils down to is you can take a piece uh, of Scripture, and, and if you dig a, uh, enough in, in that huge Bible, you can pretty well get the Bible to say anything you want to if you're willing to take it out of context. Uh, to prove the point, there, there's a Scripture in the Psalms, and, and this is a true Scripture, uh, uh, and, and you might not believe it, but this is a real Scripture, and it says this, there is no God. There is no God. Well, we better not let that one get out. You mean your Bible says there is no God? Well, yeah, it does. If, it, if you want to take it out of context. You know, uh, Psalm 53, 1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Context matters. The verse before matters. The verse after matters. Where you put a comma or a period, it matters. And when you just stop and say, judge not lest you be judged, was that Jesus' intent? Absolutely not. So what is Jesus really saying? You know, when, when I read this, this five verses this time, and like I said, I've, I've read this a hundred times and I've preached on it several times, but this time I wanted to look at it with new eyes and I had these questions. And, and I'm telling you what, I just wrote these down and this wasn't pondered or thought over. But, but as I looked over these verses, these were some of the questions I had. Why is it we can see the faults of others but we can't see our own faults? You know, I can see your faults so much easier than I can see mine. Uh, who, who's supposed to tell you uh, what logs you have? Is it your kids or your spouse or your parents or, or your brother or your, some stranger on the street? Is, are you, is it God? Who, who's supposed to tell you? Uh, how is that done? W w is there an appropriate way to show me my faults or for me to, to show you your faults? Is there an appropriate way to do it? It is, uh, how should I prepare myself to hear bad news about myself? How well do you take criticism? You know, I, I, I can say it like this. I can take criticism very well from certain people. You know, those people that don't have logs in their eye. <laughs> you know. Some people, I don't take it very well. And it's based on my bias. Uh, the person who, who, who uh, doesn't have the log in their eye might, might be pointing out something that's kind of petty. And the person who, who does have the log in their eye could be pointing out something that's very true that I probably should address. But my bias won't allow me to listen to them. You know, if I feel like somebody's attacked me or I just don't like them. Yeah. Maybe the first time I met you, you were having a bad day. Uh, maybe uh, the first time we, we met, uh, you know, I, I, I went, when I walked up to you, you were smoking cigarettes, and I made some bias, or, or some, some opinion because I saw that. Yeah. We use those things. What part does humility and pride have to play in this? A big part. Should I tell somebody if I perceive that they're in danger? Should I judge not when I know that somebody's involved in a behavior that could endanger them or somebody in their family or somebody else? Are you kidding? Is it all right for me to tell them 
what their, where the, what their spec is. Can I, should I be able to do that? What if they have a log in their eye? That was a part about this I didn't get either. Why is it that I've got a log and they've got a speck? Why don't I have a speck and they have a log? Is, does that insinuate my sin's greater than theirs always? That doesn't sound right. How do I get the log out of my own eye? This question really gets me. Am I a hypocrite? Have I ever really prayed for God to show me the log that's in my own eye? Do you really want to hear what God has to say about it? As you can see, I, I, I could ask ten more questions, but a, as you can see, five verses, lots of questions. So, what do we do with this? You know, the, as I told you out of context, you know, the preceding verses, they, they, preceding the verses that talk about logs and specs, Jesus states, judge not uh, that you uh, uh, be not judged. And, you know, for some of us, I, I look at this and it seems like this is a, a contradiction uh, to other scriptures that I read. Uh, you know, why would Jesus say this? But in Galatians, uh, uh, it, it says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, uh, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch over yourselves, lest you be tempted, bear one another's burdens, uh, and, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, doesn't that sound like it's in uh, direct... Uh, uh, it's a paradox, isn't it? It's in, in conflict with, with what Jesus is saying, isn't it? It's a paradox. And on one hand, I'm told not to judge, but then on the other hand, I, I, it, it tells us that we should keep one another accountable. What is Jesus saying before we ever consider judging others? Um, what's he telling us? We need to look at ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. We need to understand ourselves. We need to know uh, the specks or the logs that are in our own eye. We need to address those things and repent. And then after we've cleansed those things from ourselves, and only then, and with a spirit of gentleness, then maybe we would be in a position where we might help somebody else with their speck. Why do we judge others? I, you know, not everybody here struggles with this a lot, but every one of us struggles with it to some extent. Some of us struggle greatly with this. Uh, I, I, it's it's something I've struggled throughout my life. You know, uh, why why do we why are we quick to judge other people? I think there's several reasons. Maybe it's because it's easier uh, to judge somebody else than it is to judge yourself. Maybe we do it to justify our own behaviors. You know, it's like, well, you know, they're this bad, they're so bad, they're that bad, that maybe my badness doesn't look so bad. Maybe that's why uh, we judge. Uh, and maybe it's just as simple as it's our sin nature. Our sin nature. I know so many people that, that struggle with this. Uh, and uh, in the 60s, there was a, 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 a social psychologist uh, that uh, came up with this theory. It was, it's called the fundamental attribution error. And if you ever took any college level psychology, social, social psychology, you'll have heard about this. And, and what, what it is, the fundamental attribution error, it refers to an individual's tendency to attribute another's actions to their character or personality, internal, uh, an internal defect of character, while on the other hand, we attribute our own behavior to external situational factors outside of our control. So what does this look like? Uh, you know, in other words, uh, you know, I, I'm going to blame you 100% and I'm going to find fault in the thing you do and I'm going to cut myself a break if I happen to do the same thing. So, you know, uh, for instance, if uh, you have an appointment with somebody and they show up late, uh, it's real easy to immediately go to the fact, oh, they're just lazy, they're indifferent, they don't care. You know, it's internal. It's on them. Uh, th there's something wrong with them. That's why they're late. You know, what if I'm late? Oh, those darn kids unplugged my alarm clock again, you know. 
Oh, they got the road closed out here. Oh, a train pulled up. You know, I can always make excuses for myself. And I'm willing to give a break to, to myself. But what about the other people? What about that other person? And, and my quickness to, to go there. And, and sometimes uh, we, we can be quick to cut people slack just because we like them. Or they're our child. If somebody's hurt you in the past, or if you think somebody is out to get you, or you just don't like the way they look. It's much easier for us to blame uh, something that has happened on them as, as a character defect. Whereas if it's somebody you like, oh, they, they, just, they were just in a bad mood today, right? Oh, they're just a horrible person. Which is it? Often when we judge others, uh, it's a form of justifying ourselves and our own actions. And uh, you know, there's so many uh, examples of this in the Bible. I, the one that, that comes to mind is the prayer that we find in Luke chapter 18. Uh, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus uh, kind of illustrates this with this story. He, he, Jesus said, all, uh, he, he told this parable. Um, he said, um, two men went up uh, into the temple to pray, one a, a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortionists, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes uh, of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, he would not even lift up his eyes to the heaven, uh, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus tells us at the end, he says, I tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God. And then Jesus tells us this, for all who exalt themselves, listen to this, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus likes a humble person. This sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? That somebody would pray like that. Can you imagine hearing somebody pray like that? I want, to, I want you to rethink this, okay? I want you to listen to this, okay? I want to take the same passage and I want to personalize it, okay? Now hear this passage again. Now I'm going to change it just a bit, okay? Two, two people went to the church to pray. One was a member of Taylor Chapel, and the other a broken, hopeless drug addict. The member of Taylor Chapel, standing away from the dirty drug addict, prayed this prayer. God, I thank you that I'm not like all those other people, like those greedy businessmen, or that woman cheating on her husband, or some drunkard, or one of those cross-dressing homosexuals, or even like this pathetic drug addict over here. Lord, you know, I go to church almost every week. I always put 50 bucks in the collection plate. I teach Sunday school, and I serve on the trustees committee. Meanwhile, the hopeless drug addict standing off by himself, he wouldn't even lift his eyes. Instead, he just sobbed and, and cried. God, help me. God, be merciful to me, for I am the most awful kind of sinner. I tell you, <laughs> this drug addict, rather than the Taylor Chapel church member, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves, <laughs> they will be humbled. And those who humble themselves, they will be exalted. In verse 5, after Jesus says these things, he looks at the crowd, he looks at us, and he says this, you hypocrite. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Yeah. So what's this look like? You know, uh, when a person's got a log in their eye, everybody sees it but them. And you look so ridiculous. 
You know, it, it, it's like somebody who's involved in an affair uh, counseling somebody because, uh, you know, or putting somebody down or calling somebody out because they've been cheating on their wife. It's asinine. We, we, see, we see this played out in the scriptures. Uh, in, in Mark chapter 14 and John chapter 12, uh, there, there's a story about this, uh, these two sisters and a brother that live in the city of Bethany. And uh, the story you're familiar with, mostly about the two sisters, well, one of them's name is Martha, and she's cooking food for the Jesus and, and the disciples. And, and in the midst of all her work, uh, she, she can't find her sister Mary. Where's Mary? Where's Mary at? I, you know, I need some help. Where's Mary? And we know where Mary is. She's where Mary always is. She's at the feet of Jesus. And she's got this expensive, this beautiful perfume that, that is just outrageously expensive. Uh, it, it, it costs almost a year's salary uh, just for a bottle of it. And whether you see her putting it on Jesus' feet, if your view's blocked, you still know what's going on because you can smell it. Everybody knows that smell. And, and she's putting it on his feet. This sweet thing is taking place, and she's anointing Christ before, before, before he's you know, going, going to be crucified. And, and you know, there's some symbolism there of, of the burial and all these things going on, and Mary's doing this. And out of the clear blue sky comes this jerk with a log in his eye, and he says, what, 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 what are you doing? We, we, could use, we could sell that perfume, and we could use the money to help the poor. And nobody's buying it. You know who that person was? It was Judas. And we're going to know just in a few days he's going to sell out Jesus to his death for a few coins. But no, he wants to virtue signal and say, no, oh, no, we could be doing this with the poor. You know, nobody's buying it, Judas. Here's an example of you know, him looking for a speck in somebody's eye while he's got this log in his own eye and everybody sees it. You know, what kind of witness is it? We, we see something similar in the book, book of uh, uh, Samuel, Samuel uh, 2 Samuel. Uh, there's a story uh, about a prophet named Nathan who tells uh, King David this story uh, uh, about this family who, who had only one lamb. They were so poor, they were so broke, they had one lamb, and they treated this lamb like a lot of people today would treat a dog. You know, he, he drank out of the dad's cup. He ate when he slept with him. He doesn't, you know, like you guys all have your dogs and, and, you know, live like that. I don't get it, but, you know. And a rich man lives right down the street. He's got some visitors coming, and he's got all kinds of animals, but he's always noticed that that little lamb over there has been treated so gently and eats human food. Oh, I bet he's tender and good and tasty. So he goes over and he takes the guy's lamb, and he butchers it the family pet and he serves it to his guests and this prophet goes to, to David to tell him about it and he tells him the story and King David just he, he's furious he's furious he says we got to do something about this he, he's got to repay four times the lambs it, no he needs to be killed we need to, to kill him that's what he deserves who is this guy what does the prophet say? It's you. We know that King David, while he's saying this, has had an affair with a married woman. He's peep tommed on her. He's gotten her pregnant now. And now he, he doesn't want anybody to know, so he sent her to the front, her husband to the front line uh, to, to die so he can hide his, his, his sin. David had a log in his eye. What do we do? Do we do this? Friends, we are first to repent of our sins. We're to cleanse ourselves. And then and only then might we have the opportunity to help to restore someone else. But we only do it with a spirit of gentleness. One of the questions I ask is why I have a log, but you have a speck. That doesn't seem right. Why is that? Well, it's not that my sin's greater or lesser. It's not the level of the sin. I think what it is, it's because 
since it's my sin and only I can deal with it, in my life it's a log. Who else can fix this? You might have the same sin or some sin that some people might think are greater. But you know, my, my, my uh, accountability to you is only to help. I have to actually answer for myself. I have, to, I have to answer for my sins. And I'm the only one that can fix my problem with the help of, help of the Lord. You know? My problem is a log. And your problem is just a speck to me, but it's a log to you. You get it? Does that make sense? I mean, to me, that, that's kind of how I interpret that. Here's another thing. When I've got this log in my eye, everybody can see it. It's obvious, right? It's not like a speck that you can't see unless you're right up on somebody. When I got this log in my eye, it, it's there for everybody to see. I, I had a, you know, I've had a huge log in my eye for years. Years. You know? Everybody saw it, you know. I drank every day. I made a fool of myself every day. <laughs> my family knew it. My friends knew it. My co-workers knew it. Everybody knew it. I walked around, and I pretended like it wasn't the problem it was. And it was this humongous log that everybody saw. I'd leave the room, and they'd go, gosh, did you see that log in his eye? Yeah. Had a Jack Daniels label on it. Guess what happened when I removed that log? I didn't have to call people out. I didn't have to tell you about your problem. People saw me remove the log and they came to me wanting help with their speck. I didn't have to judge. Just by doing the work, just by removing it, it was so obvious to people that I had done that because it was so obvious that I had it that all of a sudden... I could be useful for the kingdom to help people with the same kind of problem that I just overcome through the help of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When you remove the log, you don't have to be a speck examiner. People will come to you. You know? Unsolicited. Unsolicited. Friends, you cannot fix other people but you can make the steps to fix yourself uh, with and through uh, the power of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ he can fix you he can fix anything but you know all my efforts for any of you in this room I, I can help you I can direct you they say you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink I can't make you drink it's outside of my wheelhouse I, I, I counsel with people, uh, especially with marriage problems. And, and, and the first meeting, and especially if I only meet with one of them at a time, the first meeting is 99% of the time uh, the list of all, all the problems, all the things that person has done, all, all the, the, the defects of character, uh, all, all the abuse and language, and, and, and them, 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 them. And, and I just sit there and I think to myself... Hey, we can't fix them. And until you accept what part you have in it, even if your part's only 5 or 10 or 15 percent, you've got to acknowledge that because that's the only part of this problem you can fix. You've got to fix it yourself. It's important that before we can make disciples, that we become disciples by removing the logs in our eyes. The Bible backs this up. We need to know ourselves. Friends, it's not always easy looking in the mirror. It's not easy taking your own inventory. But until you understand your, your defects of character, until you understand the areas you need work in, you can't fix them. And you sure as heck aren't going to fix anybody else. All you can do is work on you. And if you work on you, so many times the other person in the relationship or on the other side of the conflict gets inspired and they step up. 
I've seen it happen time and time again. This is my fault. This is my part. This is what I did. Because if you go and just say, you, 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 they're not going to admit to anything. They're going to they're be combative. It's, it's not going to fix anything. How do we handle ourselves? Uh, I'll close with these two things. One, one in the scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul tells us, examine yourselves. Spend time in the mirror. Listen to yourself. Think about how you talk to people, how you treat your, uh, the people you work with, how, how, how you act around your children and other folks. Look at yourself, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Am I in the faith? Then he says, test yourself. Then he says, or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? This is the part of the hope. No matter what brokenness is that you're going to discover when you examine yourself, you've got something greater in you than that is in the world. You have Jesus Christ in all things uh, he can fix. All things he is king. All things are, are within his power. If you acknowledge that and acknowledge your problem and give it to him, you will experience healing. There's a, a little illustration that you'll, you'll hear people say, and it's so true, and that's why people say it, I guess. But there's this adage about if you're traveling and you're on an airplane and you were happen to get into some kind of horrible turbulence or a crash situation or land in, a, in, in water, uh, they have these little oxygen things that will drop from the ceiling, right? And what do they always tell you? What have you always heard? What is your first reaction supposed to be? Are you supposed to give it to somebody else? No. You have to take it and put it on yourself first. And then after you've gotten a couple deep breaths and you gain your composure, then and only then can you help other people. If you're struggling... If you're trying to grasp for air, if you're panicked and on the verge of passing out, how much help can you be to your neighbor? How much help can you be to yourself? It's an inside job. A lot of people say, well, Pastor Derek sounds selfish. Well, it kind of is. kind of is. We must first make sure that we know who we belong to that we are in good standing, that we are working on our defects way before we start fixing other people. You know? I still need to work on myself. Now, I'm not quick to call out somebody else unless, unless I'm biased or mad. I might get my feelings hurt. When you do that, be quick to ask God to forgive you and the other person. I have to do it every now and then. It's pretty humbling. But I always feel better later. Friends, this week, a couple things. Be aware of your bias. Be aware of your bias. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. And if you struggle in this area, like I know a lot of you do, I do, pray about it. Give it to God. Continue to work on yourself. And in due time, you won't have to go out and point everybody's problems out to them. People will start bringing their problems to you and asking for help. And that's when you can really get busy doing kingdom work. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this word. And Lord, I, I just pray that uh, we as a congregation uh, will look to ourselves to, to figure out what things we need to give to you, what things we need your help with, what things that, that we uh, are, are still dealing with that we may think we're past. Lord, I pray that we'll have a, a kind heart that won't uh, play on a bias just because of one interaction with a person, that we won't just, uh, after one meeting, uh, think that we know who a person is. 
Father, I pray that each one of us will give people a break, give people a benefit of the doubt. Try to think the best until it's proven wrong. Lord, I pray that each one here will take time this week to, to think about their lives and to look at the things going on in their lives and that they would come to you uh, with, the, with the changes they want to make because, Lord, I know that you're in the business of, uh, of transforming lives and, and, Lord, we thank you for that. Now, Jesus, be with us, watch over us, and keep us ever close to you. And we pray all these things in the name of your Son. Amen. Friends, go from this place knowing that you're loved, knowing that you're forgiven, and knowing that you belong to him. Go out into the world. Be the salt, be the light, and always point to the kingdom.